We continue our series from the book of Revelation. We're up to Revelation chapter 19, which is a chapter of judgment. Now, I've probably used this illustration before, but it's one of my favourites, is that my mother's godmother lived to 99. And she taught my mother a prayer that my mother taught me that I still pray probably nearly every day of my life. Two words, perhaps today. And it just means perhaps today is the day Jesus comes back. Am I living the life that God would want me to live today? But I reflected my mother's godmother at 99, praying those words perhaps today. My impression from my mother is that uh, my, her godmother lived with an imminent sense of the return of Christ. And there's a lot of Christians today who have that same sense that any moment now Jesus could come back. And so for partly for me, I know each day if I wake up, the thought is maybe Jesus comes back. And if there's a whole lot of wedding to do, I say, well, Jesus is coming back. I can leave the wedding to tomorrow because who cares, which is not a good thing. But uh, it does give me a passion to realise the importance to be godly and to share God's word. So we come down to chapter 19. And it's an interesting chapter because it's a chapter about judgment. And uh, as we read it today in the, the 21st century, we'd say this is looking to the second coming of Christ. And in many respects it is. But if you lived in AD 70 as Jerusalem was being destroyed, you'd be thinking the book of Revelation is being fulfilled as you live day by day. So Revelation 19 speaks very strongly of judgment, but it speaks of judgment that would be in every age, of every era, of every part of the world. So AD 70, Jerusalem is being judged with the Romans attacking. But I wonder what would judgment look like today what are the things happening in our society we're thinking my gosh this makes me think that jesus could be coming back now revelations 19 is interesting because it mixes judgment with praise now last week when we looked at revelation 18 we saw that the sea captains and the uh, the trading people and the musicians were all uh, quite upset with judgment because they could see their livelihood their wealth and everything plummeting around them. In chapter 19, it's the exact opposite because uh, we see judgment of the enemies of God and praise for the salvation for those who have been faithful to God. Now, it's interesting, the idea of praise, hallelujah, is used four times here in the book of Revelation. It's the only place, hallelujah, which is a Hebrew word that's been put into the Greek text, has been used in the New Testament. Now, it's used often in the Old Testament. So how does the word hallelujah come about? Hallel means praise. Yah or Jah, God. Hallelujah, praise God. Now, you'll find it in Psalms. matter of fact, 10 of our Psalms start with the word hallelujah. So it is a a religious uh, formal sense. What it is, it's an expression of praise. It's a, a sense of joy. And so to have it here reminds us that the book of Revelation is a praise book. It's a worship book. As a matter of fact, worship is one of the key themes that we find for faithful believers in the book of Revelation. Now, in terms of uh, the text, let's turn now to Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of the great multitude of heaven. And the great multitude have turned about half a dozen times in the book of Revelation. And what did they say there in verse uh, 1? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What are they praising God for? Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And God has presented to us, in contrast to the evil trinity, that in a world of suffering, there are times that things go wrong in our life. We don't know why they've done bad things. Has that ever happened to you, that something's really bad to have you think, I don't know what God is doing in the midst of this? We need to realise that God does. And verse 2 reminds us that his judgments are true and just. We can never see the big picture, but God can. I don't know if you're as bad as me. When I was a little child, I regularly harassed my parents about certain things that I wanted for Christmas. 
and I would nag them and I would irritate them day after day after day. And when Christmas came and I'd get what I'd been nagging about, I'd be so thankful for getting what I want. But with hindsight, I realised my parents had probably bought that months ago. And so all my whinging and all my nagging was absolutely worthless because the present had already been bought. It was already in mum's cupboard, ready to be wrapped up to be for Christmas Day. They knew what they were going to get me. It was there. It was ready. But I did not know. So I'm whinging and nagging. And that can be like our prayers. There are times we're whinging and nagging to God about certain things. And God says, it's all done. It's all been set in the place. Everything's going to fall out perfectly. Not the way you like it, but the way that will be best to glorify me and give me honour. We come now to the second hallelujah there in verse 3. Once more they cried hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. What's the smoke? The smoke of judgment. The smoke of torment. And it's a direct contrast to the smoke of incense that was the prayers of believers that we found in chapter 8. Is the exact contrast to the smoke that filled the temple with the glory of God in Revelation chapter 15. And it also reminds us in terms of this eternal con, uh, uh, term, uh, ter, uh, 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 tumult is the exact opposite to that of the life of believers, where we spend eternity in heaven. There we will reign forever and ever, as it says in chapter 11. And this contrast also that you and I as believers in chapter 22 are reminded that we will get an eternal reward from God because he is faithful. So that's the third, second hallelujah. The third hallelujah. And the 24 elders who we've seen many times before and the four living creatures, and once more, what do they do? They fall down and worship God who's standing on the throne. And they say, Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God for all you servants, you who fear him, small and great. And you're kind of thinking, why would you use the word fear in heaven? Why would you say that people who are praising God are fearing God? Like normally fear is uh, when a guy's got a big stick who's about to hit you and you're scared of them. Or you go down the street and there's a bikey gang walking the opposite way and you're fearful. But this is the exact opposite to what it means for Christians in terms of fear. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there's a sense that to, to have a, this healthy understanding of fear is the starting of knowledge. It was in Proverbs chapter 14. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. In other words, true fear is life-giving. It's energising. Why? Because there's fear that's not being afraid. But the fear of the Lord is a healthy respect for the goodness, reverence, awe, holiness of God. To say I'm giving God his fear is I'm giving God his respect for who he is. I know that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's not just my mate. I sometimes get frustrated when people talk about God being their mate. Because he's the King of Kings. He's far more than that. He's somebody that we give respect for. We come now to our second key section here in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. And it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's found in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude it was like the many waters and like the sounds of mighty peals of thunder crying out. So there's this sense, this voluminous sound of praise and glory and honour and majesty. And John is caught up in the moment. And we come to the fourth hallelujah. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And this idea of God being Almighty, um, the uh, King James puts omnipotent. It's a bit like saying mega powerful. It's like this sense of putting superlative after superlative because God is in absolute and total control. Isaiah 40, when it reflects in the nature of God, says this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who has measured heaven with the span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Who's weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? 
Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who has been the counsellor to God? Who has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the paths of righteousness? Who taught God knowledge and showed him the ways of understanding? Behold, the nations are a drop in the bucket and are counted as a small dust on the scales. Look, he lift up the islands as a very little thing. What is the, John trying to get across to us in saying God's almighty? It's this sense of saying he's all-powerful, all-knowing, who's in absolute 100% control. Now, almighty is used often in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it's basically only used here in the book of Revelation and once by Paul in uh, Corinthians. Now, it's interesting here, why does uh, John use this word? He uses it of two people. He uses of God the Father, but he also uses the term of Almighty of God the Son to remind us of the power and majesty and magnificence of Jesus. He's not just a man, but God in human form. And so is John's response to this fourfold hallelujah praise. Verse 7 Let us rejoice. And exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And once more, what's the, the bride in contrast to? The great prostitute that has faced judgment. That we, the church, are a bride. And there's nothing prettier than a bride on her wedding day. If any of you suffer the Big Bang TV show, you'll realise that one of the stars got married this week and had the most atrociously wildly looking dress. And you're thinking, how gaudy could you have picked this dress to be? And it's funny, when she's walking down there, I'm thinking, gee, she looks beautiful in a whole new way because I know it's a TV show, but she was a bride. And we are the bride of Christ. And we are in the contrast to the prostitute. Then in verse 8 it goes on and said, It is granted her to clothe her with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And her simple white dress that glows is in contrast to the gaudy colours of the prostitute. Isn't it funny? One simple white dress can have so much majesty and dignity. He goes on in verse 9 and saying, The angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. It reminds us that God is going to not just let us into heaven, but we have a special place, a special honour, and a sense that we have come home in a special way. Now John is captivated by the moment because there's this glory and praise and the volume and sound that like thunder of people saying hallelujah. And he says that he fell down on his knees and to his feet in verse 10 to worship him. Who's he worshipping? The angel. And he said to me, you must not do that, says the angel. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And reminds you and I, at the end of the day, why do we come to church? It's actually about God. He's the King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, the centre of our life, of our decision making, of who we are and our purpose. We turn now in John chapter 19 to the second major vision. It's like a, a whole new section starting. And it's called the Rider on the White Horse. There in verses 11 to 13. And once more, John says, as he has said many times, I saw the heavens opened, which is his way of saying another vision is coming. And behold, a white horse, and one sitting on it is called Faithful and True and Righteous. He judges and makes war. And of course, who's the rider on the white horse? Jesus. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he often would warn people of Judgment Day. And say, Judgment Day is coming, but I'm here to present to you the Kingdom of God. And if you ever turn to Matthew chapter 24... He goes in great detail saying, this is the tribulation that you will see happening. And the Christians who lived in Jerusalem, who had read Matthew 24, when the Romans attacked, 
They said, this is judgment day for Jerusalem. We will leave. And most of them went to a place called Pella. The Jews were furious. You know, how dare you be turncoats? How dare you not fight side by side with us? <coughs> but the Christians would say, I'm sorry, this is judgment day. Your time has come. It's on you now. Repent and follow Jesus and escape with us to Pella. Or stay, be judged and die. So what does it mean to preach judgment day? In Proverbs 28 it says this, You will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Confess them and give them up. Then God will show mercy to you. don't know if you've done this, but you've been talking to people about sin. And uh, the person is a lovely non-Christian person who basically says, I've never sinned a day in my life. <laughs> I had a lovely Catholic scripture teacher in a primary school many years ago who made the comment that she hadn't sinned for at least eight or nine years. And I'm thinking, my gosh, I've sinned today. In thoughts, words and deeds. So why did Jesus come? Matthew 4 says that Jesus preached, Turn away from your sins. Because the kingdom of heaven is near. In the early church, in the book of Acts 17, the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So here we are preaching judgment day, but what is God's heart about judgment? 1 Timothy 2 4 says this God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of his truth. Spurgeon was once uh, talking about hell, uh, hell and heaven and judgment. And some of his young students were quite excited about how well they could preach hell. Imagine if one of the guys get there and say, you know, you're in a steelworks town, and you'd say to people, you know, down at BHP, you're in the steelworks, how hot the, the steel is. And they go, yes. He says, you know, in hell they use that for ice cream. And so you imagine these type of guys being all gleeful about their message. And Charles Spurgeon told his students, whenever you preach hell, preach it with tears. Why? Because you want nobody. You want nobody to go to hell. You want all to hear and to respond to be saved. And Romans 10 captures it perfectly. It says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. We preach judgment not to condemn people. We preach judgment to restore people. We tell people about hell not because we want them to go there, but for the exact opposite, we want them to never go there. So we as Christians need to be gracious. We as Christians need to be reaching out with a strong sense of love to see the transformation that Christ can bring. There's nothing sad when Christians become so judgmental that people hear judgment, not salvation. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 19, verse 12. Talking about Jesus, it says, His eyes are like the flame of fire. And as we go through these, you see, I've heard these words before. Why? Because back in Revelation chapter 1, these same type of concepts were used of Jesus there. And on his head are many crowns or many diadems. And there's a name written on them that nobody knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dripped in blood, the imagery of his death upon the cross. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. To read the Bible and hear Jesus speak was the same thing. We come now to the, the key last section is the armies of God. There in verse 14. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. As he rode on a white horse, they ride on white horses. As we are dressed like brides, the army of God are dressed like brides. And for Jesus says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword from which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of fury and the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the army of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, will follow him on white horses. So there's this real sense that the angelic beings are as godly and as holy to bring about God's judgment. 
And it's interesting, if you read Josephus, who was a uh, prophet, not a prophet, a, um, a, a historian, I should say, a Jewish historian around the time of Jesus, in AD 75, about five years after the destruction of Jerusalem, he wrote this. In Jerusalem at Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the temple, they felt a quaking, another an earthquake. They heard a great noise, and after they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. There's a sense that they thought that angelic beings were in the temple and had flown out. So this is uh, Josephus. I've got a similar quote I could use from a man called Tacitus, who's 125 AD, who writes the exact same description. Now it's interesting, Tacitus says, I know you think what I'm going to tell you next is a make made up story. I know you think it's going to sound like a fable. I know you're going to think it's all you know, whoopsie doo, but it is true, and there's lots of people who saw what I, I, I'm going to tell you. So he's very aware of how weird it is. But it appears in AD 66, before the Romans attacked, there were angelic beings in the temple, and they departed, and the door was slammed. God's judgment was coming. And what do we know about these angels there in verse 17? Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds who flew directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, great and small. The judgment imagery here is that God will curse apostate Israel. So where does this idea of birds feeding on the dead come from? Deuteronomy 28, chapter 28, is a chapter of cursing. It says, here, if you follow God, this is the blessings. If you reject God, this is the curse. And verse 26 says, your carcasses will be food for the birds of the air. When did this first get fulfilled? Before the destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans had attacked so heavily the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, that the Jewish rebels, who were three separate forces within the city, didn't have time to bury the dead. So the city was littered with dead bodies. And what happens if you've got a city full of dead bodies? The birds will come and feast on the carrion. And why the imagery of birds? The Roman army, their main ensign, the insignia that would be over every army was that of an eagle. And so as you were living in Jerusalem, you would have seen all these eagles coming towards you to devour you. Now, were all Jews killed? No. There were Jews who sided with the Romans. In fact, King Agrippa II had joined the Roman army, hoping to regain his kingdom because he'd been kicked out of Jerusalem. And so people who should have been faithful to God, like the king was on the side of the evil one. What does that say about our modern society? Will there be churches who speak against Scripture? Will there be churches who will soft-pedal things in the hope that culture will love them? The Antichrist will be both beyond the church, but within it. And we as Christians are called to be faithful in all situations. When 1 and 2 John was written, it said that the Antichrist was alive in their time. And it said there are many Antichrists, which makes you think there are Antichrists today. Would we recognise a false teacher or a false prophet? Would we recognise an antichrist? Would we see that some who are gullible will follow that which is false? We need to be faithful. Verse 19. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who were seen on a horse and against his army. Now it's interesting. Titus, who is the head of the armies of the Rome, he believed that he challenged God himself and he believed that when he destroyed the temple, he had actually killed the Jewish and Christian God. Titus couldn't see the huge difference between Christians and Jews. They both came from Jerusalem. 
They both liked the Old Testament. They both had so much in common. And there's a sense that when Jerusalem was gone, he said, I've killed your God. Go looking elsewhere. And of course, the beast and the false prophet is imagery in AD 70 of Rome. And we need to say to yourself, what is it imagery of today? There in verse 20, the beast was captured with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped an image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword They came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gouged with their flesh. For their flesh. Judgment day will come. For some of us, we will be praising God because we are saved. For others, the horror of their stupidity will come home. And imagine some people would say, I knew God was true the whole of my life and I held him at arm's length. And you say, you fool, this day is judgment day for you. What does it encourage us as Christians? To preach clearly. To tell people sincerely that God wants them. We should hunger for the lost, pray for the lost, and share wherever opportunity comes. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, help you use us to present your kingdom faithfully. Father God, we know it's your Holy Spirit that uh, converts and convicts people. Father, Father, we know that you want us to speak your word clearly. In a world of judgment, may we bring hope and love and grace and faith.